Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. You know, and all the other churches around, they're talking about that old story we all know, but I just want to let you know that it wasn't just Jesus they said about born of the virgin. They said the same thing about the Buddha. Here's their similarities. Born of a virgin, heralded by angels, tempted by the devil, began their ministries around the age of 30, renounced their riches, and dispatched disciples. So... We're going to talk about the good news because that's what we believe in here. There's a reason it's called New Thought. And it's not denominational. This is not a denominational church. I heard the other day someone was saying these two little kids were talking. And one says to the other, well, we're, we're Presbyterians, are you? And the other little kid goes, no, we belong to another abomination. <laughs> what we do here is focus on the good news, which is that everything we're seeking, we've already found. And that one spoken of as the high holy one out there is also the high holy one right inside us. So... We're not denominational, but we're the uncommon denominators. We're below the line, you might say, because we believe in the power of a spiritual practice. We meditate together. We merge east and west in here so that we can be whole together. This whole Hindu, the Hindu tradition, you know, the burrowing down deep, the going to the silent place, that's such a beautiful part of this gathering here. You know, we don't come here in order to find God. We come here in order to be God. And so the good news of this season is the same thing that I'm just going to focus on three things that both Jesus and Buddha said. The first is, you are the light of the world. We're the light of the world. Buddha said it in this way, be lamps unto yourself. The second thing was that your faith can move mountains. That's what Jesus said. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. What Buddha said, supposedly, there was no stenographers on the scene, Right? <laughs> We can't know anything but our own experience. But supposedly, Buddha said it like this. Any monk who is focused and concentrated can cut the Himalayas in two. That's how he said it. And then they both agreed, too, that there's nothing to seek. The kingdom we have within us, and the kingdom is all around us. So we can consider ourselves the finders, not the seekers, because we know enough to celebrate the sacred that's inside us. And what is sacred anyways? It's just something that inspires wonder. If it inspires wonder for you, it's sacred. A redwood forest, right? It's sacred, you know it. So we at this time in history can consider ourselves the cutting edge of creation unfolding, the cutting edge of consciousness, the very word made flesh. You know, 1984, I set out to make a peace pilgrimage around the world, and I ended up, started out actually in the Japanese Alps, 
And I'm in this place called Takamori, which is run by a man who's a Roman Catholic priest slash Buddhist. He's a Japanese man. And so I have my little cell, and all night long I'm up reading the Buddhist text because I had never been exposed to Buddhism before. So I'm reading the text, and I'm getting more and more crazy because it's all the opposite of everything I know. Christian mandate, go and teach all nations. Buddhist mandate, sit down, shut up, and see that everything's unfolding perfectly. So there were two opposing things. So every night, Father Oshida did a spiritual talk to those of us who were in the, the community. And midweek, I started having a major anxiety attack because I felt like I had to choose. I said, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm some raised Christian from a Christian nation, but now I'm reading Buddhism. It seems like the right thing to do, but please don't tell me I have to go home because I just started my peace pilgrimage. I don't know what, choose Christianity or choose Buddhism. He goes, no choice, no choice. You be both. You, he said, Jesus was the incarnation. Jesus was the event of Buddhist thought, is how he described it. Jesus is the event of Buddhist thought. He goes, you the incarnation. You keep going, you the incarnation now. No choice, do both, do both. So I'm saying from up here in the pulpit, you the incarnation. You the incarnation now. Do both, do both. So in order for it to work, for us to embody our potential enlightenment, we have to have a spiritual practice. That's the only rule. It's the one and only rule. You have to have a spiritual practice. But the spiritual practice is not leading to enlightenment. It is enlightenment. It's the act of enlightenment. So it's toning your muscles in enlightenment. It's like the poet David White says, the conversation is not about the relationship. The conversation is the relationship. Do you get it? So it's like that. So that we have a spiritual practice is non-negotiable if you have the intention of living an inspired and enlightened life. If you don't, then don't bother. But if you do, then get a practice going, even five minutes a day. So the other day, I pulled out a bulb from one of my lamps, and I noticed it was totally covered with dust and debris. You now it's probably just giving me half the light it was supposed to give me. And I thought back to when... We are all born. When we make our journey through the birth canal and come out, we have our original radiance. We are the divine thing being born. We the incarnation. <laughs> so this child, radiant by design. But what happens over the course of time, negativity, other people's bad ideas, Debris from life itself comes at us, warp speed, and our wattage goes from 100 watts down and down and down. We're born 100-watt bulbs. By kindergarten, we're already 75. <laughs> By sixth grade, we're probably down to 60. And you all know what it's like to have lunch with a 10-watt person. <laughs> right? You've, you've befriended them by now. You're not going to have them at your Christmas party. Because we are at a perilous time of crisis in our lives, and we have to protect and preserve our magnitude. We have to be very intentional about who we surround ourselves with.
in order to ensure that we're safe enough to be that light, that we can be received, and that we're not cut off. So we have to be managing the people in our lives. So what happens is the way that your spiritual practice helps you maintain your original radiance, it's like a self-cleaning oven. <laughs> you sit there, it cleans itself. You know, you have people like Wendy and me and people who come around once a week and dust it off. We dust off the debris and then you go home and you're brighter. But, you know, Meister Eckhart, he's a German mystic, he said, the process of enlightenment is a process of subtraction, not addition. You don't need all those books you get from Amazon Prime. They're not going to help you. Your spiritual practice is going to help you. You're getting rid of wrong ideas, old notions. That's why you all left the churches you were in when you were 10 and are sitting here now. Because this is a body of people who support your, the sacredness of your being. We see you. You the divine, you the incarnation. I know that about you. And you know that about me. And so the letting go of things, Meister Eckhart, that same mystic, says the greatest leave taking of all is the leaving of God for God. The leaving of the notion of God for the experience of God. And that's what we get in our spiritual practice. The experience of the sacred, of our own sacredness gets unfolded. And we are like satellite dishes for mind at large, for supreme intelligence, which is broadcasting to us every moment of every day, all night long, how Emily Dickinson says it, the only news I get is bulletins all day from immortality. Bulletins all day from immortality. So that's what happens in our spiritual practice. We prepare ourselves, we announce ourselves, we say, I'm listening right now, and then you just sit and see what happens. And what happens is totally moot. The only thing that matters is that you're sitting. It doesn't matter that you're trying to remember your cookie recipe this morning while we're in our silence. What matters is that you're here sitting with us. So that's the thing that's important, for you to become that kind of spiritual force in the world that you want to be, otherwise you would not be sitting here, requires you to have your spiritual practice, to be the one who finds and not the one who seeks, and to be the one who knows in that quiet time, in front of that candle, that what's happening there is nothing but the intimacy of communion where the mortal meets the immortal. That kind of great mystery is available to us all the time. So, I always have my spiritual practice in the morning, and then I sit there, and then I do something creative. Now, a while ago, I was sitting in a camp. I have a camp on a lake in upstate New York because I am a farm girl from upstate New York. 
So I miss those trees, I miss those lakes, so I have a little camp on a lake. And I'm there in October, and all the trees around the lake have turned red, gold, yellow, they're shimmering. And one morning, I'm sitting in the bed, I'm, I'm working on a book called No Ordinary Time, where I'm attempting to put new wine in old wineskins. So I'm looking at the Bible to see what's the book of Psalms look like? What's the book of Lamentation? What's prophets mean? So I'm reading the books of the Old Testament, and I'm getting it. You know, Lamentations is Hebrew acrostics, really. It's like Scrabble. But I can't read Hebrew. But I know this because I'm studying Lamentations. So anyway, I'm in the middle of writing a psalm, and all of a sudden, I see all this shimmering golden light coming into my room from the hallway. I leap down the hallway, look out the end where I'm looking at the lake, and the lake, it looks like it's on fire because it's early morning, it's really still like a mirror, and all these colorful... <sighs> Trees, autumn trees are just shimmering, like electrified. And so I said, oh, I have to go down on the dock. So I raced downstairs. I open up the screen door, and there's a woman out of the blue in the middle of the Adirondacks early in the morning with this thing in her hand saying, Hi, I'm a Jehovah Witness. We're trying to get more people interested in the Bible. I said, oh, that's fabulous. So am I. I said, in fact, I'm writing my own. <laughs> and everything stops. And she goes like this, you're what? <laughs> so she takes her pamphlet back. She backs up. I say, yeah, I'm writing my own. How do you do that? I said, well, it's not too hard. I said, I did two lamentations yesterday, and this morning I did a psalm. And now I look over at the lake. It's all still shimmering. I say, look, there's my burning bushes. <laughs> and this is what she does. Bye. She was scared because they're scared if they don't know how to take spiritual authority, if they don't know how to personally embody divinity. They're scared of it. But those of us who have a regular practice, who do the everyday communion, with the thing itself, then we know it's very weird to call yourself a mystic. But what is a mystic? It's anyone who has a regular, unmediated relationship with the divine. It's not an extraordinary thing. The mystic is the one who understands the oneness of all things, who feels that in herself. That's the mystic who knows there is no division between my source and me. I have an invisible dance partner. That's the mystic. The prophet is the one who speaks out when that oneness is disrupted. That's why we all have been speaking out, acting out so much in the last couple years because our oneness is, as a family, is being torn asunder. It's hugely compromised. It's breaking our hearts. And so we do what we do in our own way that's prophetic by day 
and mystic by night. Just in the way that this today incorporated the silence, the sounds of the East, this from the West, the teaching from the West, our days want to incorporate the silence of the mystical experience and the speaking out of the prophetic voice. And I know, I would bet that everybody in this room has done something to help weave our family back together again. We do it in our own ways. Poetry, song, letters to the editor, calls to the Congress. We do that. So that's why we keep our balance, and it's how we keep our balance, because we understand that this turbulence is happening for us as well as to us. And the wise ones are the ones who understand it's the same with all trauma and all tragedy. It actually happens for us so that we personally can know something. Kabir, the mystic poet, says, if you haven't experienced, if you haven't experienced it, you can't know it. So how do we get our wisdom is through the very things we have to weep and wail over. You know, I went into the convent at the age of 20, or the age of 18, because a nun saved me from killing myself when I was 12, because I was a little gay kid who learned from my church how to hate myself. And so I'm trying to figure out, how can I kill myself? And she sees the light in me, she dedicates herself, and she calls my mom, and they set out on this project called Positive Reinforcement. It was a new thing. And she helped me stay alive. And I thought, wow, if nuns help kids stay alive, I want to be a nun. So I wait six more years, going to the convent, and then promptly get kicked out after two years. You can imagine why. So, total disregard for the rules, and did anything I wanted, and it didn't work well for me. So, it was the worst trauma of my life, because I had only ever dreamed of being a nun. At age 12, I decided I never had any career plan other than that. So, it threw me into a total tailspin, and I was full of rage, full of shame, full of grief, drink, drink, drug, drug, sex, sex, terrible trajectory because I couldn't know how to heal myself. So I was self-imploding. I try therapy, talk therapy never works, nothing works, nothing works, till 30 years later. You know, I'm not saying this happens overnight. 30 years later, I finally go to the woman who was the head provincial of my community. I said, do you think you listened to me tell my story so you could maybe help me get a healing in my heart? And she did. She, I said, okay, it'll take about 20 minutes. I'll cry through it. Just don't interrupt. Let me tell the story. We did. I told the story, 20 minutes. At the end, she says, would you forgive me? for this terrible injustice done to you? I go, oh, yes, yes, I forgive you. Would you forgive the entire community for this terrible injustice that was done to you? Yes, I forgive the entire community. Like, I wasn't holding on to that they need, you know, I ought to, they have to ask forgiveness. It wasn't my agenda. But as a result of that, something opened up in me. And this whole new awareness washes over me 
that there's nothing to forgive. They had actually allowed me to have a monastic life for two years, and then I could go gently away to have the life I was born to stand here, to do the things I was born to do. So I was gifted by them of two years so I could get my mystic roots, so I could learn what it means to have a prophetic voice. So nothing to forgive became a new piece of wisdom that cost me 30 years to get because I'm a slow learner. <laughs> but now I know it. And it, it's a template for everything for me. That and that I created it myself. You know, those two years, I wasn't just being a good old nun. I was drinking wine from the altar. I'm smoking cigarettes in the woods. I'm kissing novices. I'm doing anything I want to do. And that's what it looks like when Jan Phillips tries to get herself kicked out of the convent. Do you see what I mean? So partly when you're experiencing the turbulence of your life, you're experiencing often something that you yourself are co-creating. And that it is happening to you, yes, but also for you. So that you will have some velvet jewels some jewels for your velvet pouch, pouch. You will have some wisdom that's yours that I don't have. So this is how we, how it happens. It happens to us, it happens through us, it happens for us. And the further along we are on that evolutionary trajectory, the more we're in touch with the insight that this thing right here is all the divine. This experience is all the divine. There is nothing happening that's not the sacred penetrating our lives. So I'm going to end with this little reading, which I love. And it's about a donkey, so I am bringing in the Christmas story somehow. <laughs> Once a donkey ascended to the shining gates of the kingdom of heaven. The gates were open. The donkey heard music more beautiful than anything he had ever imagined. Each note was a star going supernova. The song poured itself into the world. The donkey stood transfixed. Without thinking, he opened his mouth wide and brayed. Instantly, the music stopped. There was total silence. His bray had been off key. Terrible, a donkey sound. Slowly, the gates of the kingdom of heaven begin to swing shut. The donkey didn't know what to do. The light was blinding. He took one trembling step forward, then another. He couldn't see a thing. The donkey brayed again, knowing it would not be beautiful. He was right. It wasn't beautiful. It was the same old donkey bray. He did it again and again. He couldn't tell if the gates were open now or closed, or even where they were. He shut his eyes and thought about the entirety of his life. He remembered eating hay, carrying firewood. He brayed again. He did. He kept his eyes closed and staggered forward, belting it out. Carrier of firewood, eater of hay. He took his whole life's only song and he employed it step after step into brightness, into terrible, dazzling light. And that's our call. You know, Jesus asked, who do they say I am? And people, when you wonder, who do they say you are? Make sure you're belting out your truth. Make sure you're 
dictating to the world what you want to be said about you. Because we will say, you are what you do. So keep your bulb clean. Do your self-cleaning oven ritual. Sit in silence a little bit each day. And above all, be joyful. Thanks. The Unity Center, spiritually progressive, socially responsive, radically inclusive. We have services on Sundays at 9 and 11. Many people enjoy Reverend Wendy's talks and meditations and aren't able to attend the Unity Center in person. If you're part of our extended family from around the world and would like to help support the Unity Center, please go to our website or download our free app, which offers even more ways to connect with the Unity Center. Namaste.